Now, could I have the next? Let me see, do I have more pictures of the dinner party? No, no, go back. I don't have more pictures of the dinner party, so I'll have to talk about it here. Okay. <clears throat> the story of the dinner party, as Karen discussed, was a story of fighting against censorship at every level. It wasn't covert anymore. And there were a multiple form, there were multiple forms of censorship that the dinner party encountered. The dinner party opened, it took me five years to create the dinner party. I worked alone for the first year and a half and with a small number of people for the next year and a half. And then in the last two years, we were in production. There were many, many people who worked on the dinner party, helping me to realize my vision. However, one thing I do want to say about the collaboration is that there is a huge myth in the art world about the individual male genius working alone in his studio. Picasso never cast his own bronze sculptures. Matisse, well, Matisse probably painted his own paintings. I doubt he made his own stained glass windows, the ones in the fantastic church in Arles. Henry Moore did not carve his large scale stone sculptures, nor cast his major bronze sculptures. And Robert Rauschenberg did not make his, all the prints he made alone. That is a myth. Behind the individual male artist of any note or stature lies a phalanx of assistants. Jeff Koons barely touches his own work. He has a factory of 150 people producing it. So it's not that what I did with the people who assisted me in the dinner party was so unusual. What was unusual about it is that it was a woman-centered project and a woman artist who managed to piece together an alternative structure of support when she couldn't get support from the art world. The dinner party opened in 1979 on March 14th at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, which intended to premiere and to tour the dinner party. In the three months that the dinner party was at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, 100,000 people saw it. People waited in line between five and six hours to see it. The museum balanced its annual budget, and the museum bookstore made so much money that they bought a computerized cash register that they called Judy. <laughs> Inexplicably, Despite the incredible success of the first showing of the dinner party, the planned exhibition tour collapsed. If you ask why, that's a very difficult question to answer because museums have a whole array of standard answers about why they cancel or don't take exhibitions. It doesn't fit into our schedule, it's too large. However, these were museums that had already made a commitment that canceled. And at the end of the first showing, the dinner party went into storage and the, and the artists went into shock. I had set out to test the art system to see as well as to tell the story of women in Western, the contributions of women in Western civilization. I also wanted to test the art system to see if a woman working at the same level of aspiration that men have always have been able to work at, whether the art system would support her. And at first it looked like the answer was yes. And then the exhibition tour collapsed and the dinner party became the piece that everybody wanted to see and nobody wanted to show. What happened was an unprecedented grassroots movement grew up all over America then in Canada, and then around the world. People were so outraged that their museums would not show a piece that they wanted to see, that they organized their own exhibitions. They found spaces, they rented spaces, they renovated spaces, they staffed the space, 
or they raised enough money to underwrite the show if a museum would take it. City after city, the dinner party toured to record crowds, and almost all the grassroots groups made back the money they had raised and made profits. Some of those profits went into women's foundations that were started as a result of the exhibitions. Many of the places where the dinner party was shown, like in Chicago and in Boston, were in funky parts of town, and the infusion of 60 to 100,000 viewers for the dinner party gentrified that part of town. The space in Boston where the dinner party was shown was an old cyclorama that is now the Boston Center for the Arts, which was born out of the dinner party exhibition. The dinner party toured this way from 1979 to 1988 to 15 venues, six countries, three continents, to a viewing audience of one million people. Meanwhile, I had nothing. I lost everything when the tour collapsed. The kind of reviews I got from the art world when the dinner party particularly went to New York, brought there by a grassroots group which raised the money for the Brooklyn Museum to show it. The Brooklyn Museum, that was the first time they ever had to have a ticket system because they had 80,000 people at the show. A lot of people who weren't in the art world who went to see the dinner party were very confused by the fame that seemed to accompany the showing of the dinner party as it traveled, my fame. They thought that I made money from the long lines, that I made money from the products sold in the museum shops. They didn't realize what I, was, what I had encountered myself, which was, as I said, when the dinner party tour collapsed, I lost everything. I lost my studio, my staff, my marriage. I was $30,000 in debt, which was a lot in 1979. And I had to start all over again. I had nothing. I had moved to Northern California and rented a small studio when it looked like the dinner party was going to be a big success in the hopes of being able to start on a porcelain room because from the beginning my goal was to permanently house the dinner party. I knew that only by permanent housing, only through permanent housing would the story of the erasure of women's history be overcome. But through all those years when the dinner party was traveling, there was no guarantee that the dinner party would not be erased, that it would not repeat the story that it recounted. And so I had to do something that's very unusual for artists. I had to stay tied to the dinner party until 2007, when it was finally permanently housed. I had to stay tied to it because I wasn't prepared to let the dinner party, the information that, about women's history that it represented, I wasn't prepared to let it be lost. I had to figure out how to care for the dinner party, how to raise enough money to care for the dinner party when it wasn't on view, how to make sure when it was exhibited that it was properly exhibited, and then when it came back in 1988 to pay for storage, which was not cheap. Meanwhile, I was also trying to go on as an artist. I'm going to come back to the dinner party story when I tell you about the Holocaust Project. Right now, I'm going to move into the next, the 80s. Now imagine the dinner party is traveling all over the world under the auspices of this tiny little nonprofit organization that I started at the end of the dinner party in order to accept donations to finish it. I had no idea that Through the Flower would become not only the touring agency for the dinner party, but the only source of support I had to go on as an artist because I still had a burning desire to make art. What happened was, as the dinner party toured, I got hun literally hundreds of letters from people saying that if I ever did another project, they would like to volunteer and work with me. 
A lot of those people were needle workers because they had been very moved by what I had done with needlework in the dinner party. They saw, and this is one of the great mysteries of all time, how it is po was possible that I, who could neither stitch nor sew, had an unaccountable ability to design for needlework. But I do. I discovered it in the dinner party. And while I was working on the dinner party, I became interested in the subject of birth. I wanted to do a project about birth because there were very few images in the history of Western art about a subject which surely is universal because we're all born and half the world has the capacity to do it. I used to quip, if men had babies, there would be thousands of images of the crowning. As it was, there were very few. So there I am, the dinner party is touring. I'm struggling to try and figure out how to keep working. I, I'm in Northern California living in the smallest apartment with the smallest studio I've had since I was 21. And I have these letters of, with, from people who wanted to work with me. And out of that, I constructed a network of support so that I was able to create 85 images on birth and creation in various needle and textile forms, which we traveled to 100 venues all around the country to a viewing audience of about 250,000 people because there was still a great hunger among people to see art that affirmed women's experiences. And through the flower, because we were having such a difficult time with the showing and, and of course the eventual permanent housing of the dinner party, which at that point was a distant dream, we wanted to make sure that the birth projects were, were exhibited, the birth project work. So we came up with a system that kind of went around the art system because what had I learned from the dinner party? That the museums and art institutions, instead of distributing the dinner party, were blocking the dinner party. The critics, instead of explaining the dinner party, were misrepresenting the dinner party, which is another form of, of censorship. The dinner party is a, a symbolic history of women in Western civilization, or as I sometimes say, a reinterpretation of the Last Supper from the point of view of those who've done the cooking throughout history. <laughs> the dinner party is not vaginas on plates. That's a form of censorship. To misrepresent something is to censor its true meaning. It took 25 years for the New York Times to stop describing the dinner party as vaginas on plates. When it first happened in 1980, when the dinner party was shown at the Brooklyn Museum, I was really upset. But once the New York Times, somebody from the New York Times says something, the New York Times does not contradict itself. So it took 25 years and a massive change in history until the New York Times finally corrected itself, stopped censoring the true meaning of the dinner party. And the New York Times is the most powerful newspaper in America. It took 25 years until the New York Times stopped censoring me and the dinner party by misrepresenting it. Now, in order to get around what we had learned about the distribution system of the art world, that it was not prepared to do what it is supposed to do, which is distribute art to the audience, we devised a whole new strategy of creating what was called exhibition units, where each needlework traveled with its own documentation, its own installation design, white gloves, and brads for installing the needleworks. So anybody could do a birth project exhibition. And all kinds of people did. Birthing centers, Planned Parenthoods, hospitals, men's, centers, once men's centers started developing, some galleries, some museums. That's how the birth project traveled. 
And then we gifted work to various institutions, not knowing that another form of censorship is when art ends up in the basement. For example, I just had a show in Canada, a traveling show that my New York gallery put together called Setting the Table, Preparing Judy Chicago's Dinner Party. And it went to this small museum in Canada where there was a new director who's a feminist. And in preparation for the show, and when she first got to the museum, she went into something called the closet. The closet was a room that the museum used for the work they didn't want to show. She went into the closet, and guess what was in there? Art by women. The closet was a form of censorship. The basement is a form of censorship. But when we were trying to devise strategies to get around the resistance of the art system by gifting work, we didn't think about the basement. We thought, ah, we'll gift the work, it'll become part of the permanent collection, it'll be shown. Another form of censorship is the fact that even in institutions like the one I just described to you that had a closet that has work by women, in most major museums, only three to five percent of the permanent collection is women. And then few of them are shown. So when you go to a lot of the major museums, you wouldn't even know there was a lot of art by women because it's been censored. It hasn't been like, oh, we're gonna go censor that. It's been censored by something much more subtle, by the idea of what's important. Who decides what's important? If you don't get to see work by women or artists of color, how can you decide if that work is important to you? The museums make that decision for you by showing you the art they decide is important. So censorship is rife in the art world. It informs the art world, even while the art world says censorship is bad. After I finished, even while I was finishing the birth project, I became interested in the gender construct of masculinity at a time before gender studies, at a time before queer theory, in the middle, early 1980s, when I went to the library to look at, investigate issues of gender, the only thing that came up was writing about women, as if only women have gender. I did a series of paintings drawings, weavings, cast paper pieces, and bronzes. And each one of the groupings I show you stand for a whole series of work. Thus, the two birth project works stand for 85 works. The two power play works stand for a whole large series of works. When I showed power play in 1987 in New York, it was met with another form of censorship. Silence, complete and total silence. Now, I'm not sure what I'd rather have, vitriol or silence, but actually they're two sides of the same coin. Either beat the artist to a pulp by misrepresentation, vitriol, and hostility, or don't say a word about the artist's work. Now, I'm happy to say that Power Play is going to have another chance this next year when my Santa Fe Gallery and my New York State Gallery are going to show it, and they're going to have a, they're writing, having a, they're publishing a catalog which will be, where the catalog essay will be written by probably the most prominent queer theorist in America who is going to be here in a few weeks, Jonathan Katz. And I am like thrilled to death because the development of gender studies 
and queer theory creates a critical context for re-examining power play. Okay, next. Could I have the next one, honey? Donald? Yeah, thanks. Okay. In 1985, while I was finishing Power Play, I met and married my husband, photographer Donald Woodman, who, who prepared all these PowerPoints, images. At that point, I had become interested in the subject of the Holocaust. I come from a... I come from 23 generations of rabbis up till my father, who broke away, who became a labor organizer. When I told a rabbi this when we were working on the Holocaust Project, he said, not to worry, Moses was the first labor organizer. <laughs> my father was also a student of history and a political activist. And yet, when I was growing up and Donald was growing up, there was no mention of the subject of the Holocaust at all in our houses. Both of us were raised in secular Jewish families. My father, as I said, broke away. And we knew very little about our heritage as Jews. Maybe it was because, as you see in the work I've shown you so far, I was interested in issues of power and powerlessness, in that I was interested in why women have been powerless or why powerful women have been excised from the historic record. I was interested in the birth process, which it turns out is incredibly powerful. If anybody ever has watched, and younger men have, of course, watched their partners give birth, you know that giving birth is a hugely powerful experience. I was interested in power and the way men have exercised it, often badly, in power play. So maybe it was the issues of power and powerlessness that drew me to the subject of the Holocaust because, after all, that, that is a uh, demonstration of the most grotesque relationship between power and powerlessness. Whatever the reason, when Donald and I met, I told him I wanted to go to New York and see Shoah, a film about the Holocaust by a French filmmaker named Claude Lanzmann. It's a nine-hour film. And we flew to New York in the fall of 1985 and watched the film over a weekend and were just completely overwhelmed by it and decided that we would do a project together on the subject of the Holocaust. The Holocaust Project took eight years. It was one of the most grueling and daunting projects I've ever undertaken. The bulk of the Holocaust Project combines painting and photography, like in that small image on the upper right, which is called The Banality of Evil, Struthoff. And it's a history painting. Donald photographed the inn that was three kilometers from a, a concentration camp in the Alsace-Lorraine area of France. And sometime during the war, the bathhouse across from the inn, which was a hangout for the local populace and the SS, sometime during the war, the bathhouse was turned into the gas chamber for the uh, camp. And whether or not people were killed during the day, everyone must have known what was going on if they sat across the street because the stench of human flesh burning is unmistakable. The Holocaust Project is introduced by a stained glass window and concludes with a stained glass window. And the entry piece is an 18-foot tapestry called The Fall, I select particular materials or techniques because of what I want to express. And in this case, I wanted to express the fact that Donald and I, after eight years of research, had determined that the Holocaust grew out of the very fabric of Western civilization. The fall is a visual narrative demonstrating how, in fact, the Holocaust can be seen to grow from our history. Now, the, one of the, the Holocaust Project traveled for 10 years to museums and to um, 
Jewish institutions. Donald and I wanted to bridge the gap that seemed to exist in the mid 80s and early 90s in that if you went to most contemporary art museums at that time, you would never even know the Holocaust had happened. And in Jewish museums, there was way too much on the sub art on the subject of the Holocaust, but it had never been subjected to rigorous art criticism and what little art there was in the art institutions on the subject of the Holocaust had never been subjected to criticism by Holocaust scholars or survivors, and we wanted to cross back and forth. Now, the Holocaust Project was met with the most unbelievable hypocrisy by the art world. Here, Donald and I had spent eight years immersed in the subject. The art world knows, as I said, you wouldn't even have known the Holocaust happened if you went to most museums. And yet, they're like, oh my God, how could Judy Chicago and Donald Woodman have dared to touch the subject of the Holocaust? So they became the defenders of the Holocaust, even though they never gave a shit about the subject up till that point. Hypocrisy is another form of censorship. Nevertheless, and this is one of the amazing things about my work, is that despite all these various forms of censorship, my work has continued to be seen even though it's been seen in marginalized institutions, small venues, there are always a big audience for my work, which makes me very gratified. And that's because many people have a hunger for art that speaks to them about subjects they care about. And it's a demonstration of the power of art that my work continues to be, continued to be seen even in the face of censorship in its myriad of forms. Now, while Donald were, and I were in the middle of the Holocaust Project, immersed in a project examining the state turning against its own citizens, the dinner party was debated, if you can call it that, in, the House of Re in our own House of Representatives for one hour and 27 minutes, entirely by men, none of whom had ever seen the dinner party. <laughs> I was recovering from a small oper minor operation when we were alerted that the dinner party was going to be, quote, debated. And we turned on e ESPN or C-SPAN, and sat there speechless. I'm like, do they always not know what they're talking about? 